Greetings to all of you. A warm welcome to all of you. My dear friends, my dear sisters and brothers, this is your pastor, Yeti. The pursuit of God, the gaze of the soul. Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrew 12, verse 2. Let us think of our intelligent, plain human being. I think I mentioned that a while ago in my other broadcastings, that coming for the first time to the reading of the scriptures. He approaches the Bible without any previous knowledge of what it contains. He is holy without prejustice. He has nothing to prove and nothing to defend. Let me say such a person will not have read long until his mind begins to observe certain truths standing out from the page. They are the spiritual principles behind the record of God's dealings with man and woven into the the writings of holy men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. As that person reads on, might want to number these truths and they become clear and makes a brief summary under each number. These summaries will be the tenets of his biblical creed. Further reading will not affect those points except to enlarge and strengthen them. Now, this human being, what I was just in the beginning talking about, is finding out what the Bible actually teaches. High up on the list of things which the Bible teaches will be the doctrine of faith. The place of weighty importance which the Bible gives to faith will be too plain for him to miss. He will very likely conclude faith is all important in the life of the soul. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith will get me anything. Take me anywhere in the kingdom of God, but without faith, there can be no approach to God, no forgiveness, no deliverance, no salvation, no communion, no spiritual life at all. Now, by the time my friend has reached the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the eloquent encomium, which is there pronounced upon faith, will not seem strange to him. He will have read Paul's powerful defense of faith in his Roman and Galatians epistles. Later, if he goes on to study church history, 
he will understand the amazing power and the teaching of the reformers as they showed the central place of faith in the Christian religion. Now, if faith is so vitally important, if it is an indispensable must in our pursuit of God, it is perfectly natural that we should be deeply concerned over whether or not we possess this most precious gift. And our minds being what they are, it is inevitable that sooner or later we should get around to inquiring after the nature of faith. What is faith? Would lie close the question. Do I have faith? And would demand an answer if it were on anywhere to be found. Almost all who preach or write on the subject of faith have much the same things to say concerning it. They tell us that it is believing a promise, that it is taking God at His word, that it is reckoning the Bible to be true and stepping out upon it. The rest of the book or sermon is usually taking up with stories of persons who have had their prayers answered as a result of their faith. These answers are mostly direct gifts of a practical and temporal nature such as healing, money, physical protection or success in business. Or if the teacher is of a philosophic turn of mind, he may take another course and lose us in a welter of metaphysics or snow us under with physical jargon as he defends of as he defines and redefines, pairing the slender hair of faith thinner and thinner till it disappears in gossamer shavings at last. When he is finished, we get up disappointed and got out by that same door wherein we went, and surely there must be something better than that, than that it is. And I'm not judging the philosophers. What I bring you is that you also be very serious about your own spiritual life. That you take it serious. What you do with the love that is given to you. In the scriptures there is a practically no effort made to define faith. Outside of a brief 14-word definition in Hebrew 11 verse 1, I know of no biblical definition and even their faith is defined functionally, not philosophically, that is, it is a statement of what faith is in operation, not what it is in essence. It assumes the presence of faith and shows what it results in, rather than what it is. We will be wise to go just that far and attempt to go no further. We are told from whence it comes and by what means, and faith is a gift of God. And faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. This much is clear. And the paraphrase, and to paraphrase Thomas A. Kempis, I had rather exercise faith than know the definition thereof. From here on, when the words faith is or their equivalent occur in this chapter, I ask that they be understood to refer to what faith is in operation as exercised by a believing person. Right here we drop the notion of definition and think about faith as it may be experienced in action. The complexion of our thoughts will be practical and not theoretical. In a dramatic story in the book of Numbers, it's the Old Testament, faith is seen in action. Israel became discouraged and spoke against God. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among them, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. And then Moses sought the Lord for them, and he heard, and gave them a remedy against the bite of the serpents. He commanded Moses to make a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole inside of all the people. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Moses obeyed, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And that chapter of the book of Numbers is chapter 21, the verses 4 to 9. Now, in the New Testament, this important bit of history is interpreted by us by no less an authority than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is explaining to his hearers how they may be saved. They tell them that it is by believing. Then to make it clear, he refers to this incident in the book of Numbers. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, verses 14 and 15. Now, our person that I started in the beginning in reading this would make an important discovery. Either way, it will be a man or a woman, it doesn't matter, but he would notice that look and believe were synonymous terms. Looking on the Old Testament, serpent is identical with believing on the New Testament, Christ. And that is, the looking and the believing are the same thing. And he would understand that while Israel looked with their external eyes, believing is not what the heart is not with the heart. I think he would conclude that faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. When he had seen this, would remember passages he had read before 
and their meaning would come flowing over him. They looked unto, unto him and were lightened, and their face were not ashamed. Psalm 34, verse 5, Unto thee lift I up my eyes. O you that dwells in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, and that he have mercy upon us. Psalm 123, verse 1 and 2. Here the man seeking mercy looks straight at the God of mercy and never takes his eyes away from him till mercy is granted. And our Lord himself looked always at God. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the bread to his disciples. Indeed, Jesus thought that he wrought his works by always keeping his inward eyes upon his Father his powerly and his continuous look at God. John 5, 19 to 21. In full accord with the few texts we have quoted is the whole tenor of the inspired word. It is summed up for us in the Hebrew epistle when we are instructed to run life's race, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. From all this, we learn that faith is not a once-done act, but a continuous gaze of the heart at the tree and God. Believing, then, is a directing the heart's intention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. At first this may be difficult, but it becomes easier as we look steadily at this wondrous person, quietly and without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief excursion away from him, the attention will return again and rest upon him like a wandering bird coming back to its window. I would emphasize this one committal, this one great volitational volitional act which establishes the heart's intention to gaze forever upon Jesus. God takes this intention for our choice and makes what allowance he must for the thousands of distractions which besets us in this evil world. He knows that we have set the direction of our hearts toward Jesus and we can know it too, and comfort ourselves with the knowledge that a habit of soul is forming, which will become after a while a sort of spiritual reflex, requiring no more conscious efforts on our part. Faith is the least self-regarding of the virtues. It is by its very nature, scarcely conscious of its own existence, like the eye which sees everything in front of it and never sees itself. Faith is occupied with the object upon which it rests and pays no attention to itself at all. While we are looking at God, we do not see ourselves. Blessed riddance. 
The man who has struggled to purify himself and has had nothing but repeated failures will experience real relief when he stops tinkering with his soul and looks away to the perfect one. While he looks at Christ, the very things he has so long been trying to do will be getting done within him. It will be God working in him to will and to do. Faith is not in itself a meritorious act. The merit is in the one toward whom it is directed. Faith is redirecting of our sight and getting out of the focus of our own vision and getting God into focus. Sin has twisted our vision inward and made it self-regarding. Unbelief has put self where God should be. And is perilously close to the sin of Lucifer who said, I will set my throne above the throne of God. Faith looks out instead of in and the whole life. And all this may seem too simple. So faith looks out instead of in and the whole life falls into in line. But we have no apology to make. To those who would seek to climb into heaven after help or descend into hell, God says, the word is Nadi. Even the word of faith. The word induces us to lift up us our eyes unto the Lord and the blessed work of faith begins. When we lift our inward eyes to gaze upon God, we are sure to meet friendly eyes gazing back at us. For it is written that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. The sweet language of experience is You, God, sees me. When the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, heaven has begun right here on this earth. When all my endeavor is turned toward you because all your endeavor is turned toward me, when I look unto you, along with all my intentions, nor even turn inside the eyes of my mind, because you thus unfold me with your constant regard. When I direct my love toward you, alone because you, who are love's, who art's love self, has turned you toward me alone. And what, Lord, is my life, save that embrace wherein you delight some sweetness that so lovingly enfold me? So wrote Nicholas of Cusa 400 years ago. I should like to say more about this old man of God. He is not much known today anywhere among Christian believers and among current fundamentalists. He is known not at all. I feel that we could gain much from a little acquaintance with men of his spiritual favor and the school of Christian thought which they represent.
Nicholas was a true follower of Christ, a lover of the Lord, radiant and shining in his devotion to the person of Jesus. His theology was orthodox, but fragrant and sweet as everything about Jesus might properly be expected to be. His conception of eternal life, for instance, is beautiful in itself, and, if it mistakes not, is nearer in spirit to John 17.3 than that which is current among us today. Life eternal, says Nicholas, is not other than that blessed regard wherewith you never cease to be Hold me. Yea, even the secret places of my soul. With you to behold is to give life, this unceasingly to impart sweetest love of you. This to inflame me, the love of your, the love of you by loving imparting and to feed me by inflaming and by feeding the kindle to kindle my yearning and by kindling to make me drink of the dew of gladness and by drinking to infuse in me a fountain of life and by infusing to make it increase and endure. Now, if faith is the gaze of the heart at God, and if this gaze is but the raising of the inward eyes to meet the all-seeing eyes of God, then it follows that it is one of the easiest things possible to do. It would be like God to make the most vital things easy and place it within the range of possibility for the weakest and poorest of us. Several conclusions may fairly be drawn from all this. The simplicity of it, for instance. Since believing is looking, it can be done without special equipment or religious paraphernalia. God has seen to it that the one life and death essential can never be subject to the caprice of Accident, an accident, I mean. Equipment can break down or get lost. Water can leak away. Records can be destroyed by fire. The minister can be delayed or the church burned down. All these are external to the soul and are subject to accident or mechanical failure. But looking is of the heart and can be done successfully by any man. And I repeat my word, man, it's to as well women as men. Standing up or kneeling down or lying in his last agony a thousand miles from any church. Since believing is looking it can be done any time. No season is superior to another season for this sweetest of all acts. God never made salvation depend upon new moons, nor holy days or Sabbaths. A man is not nearer to Christ on Easter Sunday than he is, say, on Saturday, August the 3rd, or Monday, October 4th. As long as Christ sits on the mediatorial throne every day is a good day and all days are days of salvation neither does place matter in this blessed work of believing God lift your heart and let it rest upon Jesus and you are instantly in a sanctuary though it be a Pullman bird or a factory or a kitchen, whatever. You can see God from anywhere if your mind is set to love 
and obey him. Now, someone may ask, is not this of which you speak for special persons such as monks or ministers who have by the nature of their calling more time to devote the quiet meditation? Now, I am a busy worker and have little time to spend alone. I am happy to say that the life I describe is for every one of God's children regardless of calling, regardless. It is, in fact, happily practiced every day by many hardworking persons and is beyond to reach of none. Many have found the secret of which I speak and, without giving much thought to what is going on within them, constantly practice this habit of inwardly gazing upon God. They know that something inside their heart sees God, even when they are compelled to withdraw their conscious attention in order to engage in earthly affairs. There is within them a secret communion always going on. Let their attention but be released from a moment from necessary business and it Please at once to God again. This has been the testimony of many Christians, so many that even as I stated, it has I have a feeling that I am quoting, though from whom are from how many I cannot possibly know. I do not want to leave the impression that the ordinary means of grace have no value. They must assuredly have. Private prayer should be practiced by every Christian. Long periods of biblical meditation will purify our gaze and direct it. Church attendance will enlarge our outlook and increase our love for others. Service and work and activity, all are good and should be engaged in by every Christian. But at the bottom of all these things, giving meaning to them, will be the inward habit of beholding God. A new set of eyes, so to speak, will develop within us and enable us to be looking at God. While our outward eyes are seeing the scenes of this passing world. Someone may fear that we are magnifying private religion out of all proportions. That the us of the New Testament is being displaced by a selfish I. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshippers 
met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become united in unity, conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Social religion is perfected when private religion is purified. The body becomes stronger as its members become healthier. The whole church of God gains when the members that compose it begin to seek a better and a higher life. All the foregoing presupposes true repentance and a full committal of the life to God. It is hardly necessary to mention this, for only persons who have made such a committal will have read this far. When the habit of inwardly gazing Godward becomes fixed within us, we shall be as Herod unto a new level of spiritual life, more in keeping with the promises of God and the mood of the New Testament. The tree and God will be our dwelling place even while our feet walk the low road of simple duty here among men. We will have found life's summon bonum indeed. There is the source of all delights that can be desired, not only can not better by thought out by men and angels, but not better can exist in the mode of being. For it is the absolute maximum of every rational desire than which a greater cannot be. Pray with me. O Lord, I have heard a good word inviting me to look away to you and be satisfied. My heart longs to respond, but sin has clouded my vision till I see you. But dimly, be pleased to cleanse me in your own precious blood and make me inwardly pure that I may with unveiled eyes gaze upon you all the days of my earthly pilgrimage. Then I, she, then I shall I, then shall I be prepared to behold you in full splendor in the day when you shall appear to be glorified in your saints and admired in all them that believe. Amen. May God bless your heart. Blessings to all of you. This is your pastor, Yari. Bye.